<laughs> okay, so uh, after quite a long break, uh, we uh, rejoin and uh, meet again in the uh, Microbiology Journal Club, hosted by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And today we have a great speaker, uh, Seth Bordenstein, speaking from uh, Penn State University. Uh, and uh, Seth is the uh, chair in microbiome science, a professor of uh, biology and entomology, and entomology, and also the director of the One Health Microbiome Center, which is a quite large uh, microbiome center located in, in Penn State. Uh, Seth did his uh, PhD at the University of uh, Rochester in evolutionary genetics. Uh, then he followed to a postdoc in uh, Woods Hole in Massachusetts. Uh, and he stayed there for quite a long time, also as an uh, adjunct scientist and also as an adjunct uh, uh, professor at uh, Brown University in, in Boston. And then in 2008, he moved to Vanderbilt University in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, where he stayed for quite a long time, between 2008 till 2022, uh, all the way from assistant to a uh, full professor. And he decided to move uh, to Penn State two years ago, uh, serving in the uh, positions that I just mentioned. Uh, Beth uh, Seth's uh, lab is studying uh, various uh, questions. Uh, for example, what are the rules of uh, human microbiome variation and how do they uh, intersect with uh, health uh, disparities? Uh, today, I think we'll hear about uh, Wolbachia which is a very cool endosymbiont, which is inherited uh, within uh, different autoprods. Uh, and uh, Seth is working for many years on the interaction between Wolbachia, mosquito, and the uh, uh, bacteriophages that are the prophages that are located within Wolbachia. And Wolbachia has a very cool phenotype that I guess we will hear that it can cause to a uh, cytoplasmic incompat incompatibility which is a very cool way to control uh, mosquitoes and insects in, in general. Uh, and Seth's, uh, uh, Seth's lab uh, identified actually a few years ago, the genes within Bol Wolbachia that are uh, responsible for this very important uh, phenotype. Uh, his lab also studies uh, the, how microbiome and virome uh, affect speciation of different hosts and is very uh, much involved in uh, science education in different projects. Uh, he's uh, also, he mentored many, many students along the years, 15 postdocs, one of them, Iran, speaking in this forum, I think a year ago, talk. And uh, he's also, so there, there's a very, very long CV. Uh, he is also a fellow of the, and less considered as a high. Uh, with this, uh, I'll stop and uh, uh, set the, the stage is yours. Thank you, Asaf. I'm, I'm really appreciative of this invitation to join you uh, in your community today and to kickstart the, I guess, the new cycle. Um, if my voice uh, doesn't translate over well, let me know and I'll try and adjust things over here. Um, so but I will go ahead. No, no, it's perfect. Okay, yes. good. Um, sometimes it comes in and out and just let me know. We can stop and fix that. Um, I'm happy to take questions along the way, or if you save your questions to the end, we can do it then. Um, and I look forward to uh, teaching you a little bit about what is the most fascinating symbiosis in my mind. And I'll try and uh, convince you to think a little bit about that more today. Well, first, I'd like to start with the visible world. And when we ask a dramatic question like this, we might think about, uh, well, what's the most dangerous animal in the world? What would you think? What would you say first at first stroke? Some would say maybe sharks. Some would say, well, humans, of course. Um, but in fact, the most dangerous animal in the world is this pesky and dangerous mosquito. And so mosquitoes are rank this high because they cause about 1 million deaths per year and 400 million cases of vector-borne and infectious diseases from arboviruses to plasmodium malaria and more. 
And the great um, the great problem with this mosquito and these numbers is while they carry these viruses by biting humans that have them and transmitting them to somebody who doesn't have them, the issue is that climate change and urbanization are both poised to make this animal even more dangerous than it is today. Um, breeding grounds will expand because of climate change and because of contact, increasing contact with humans during urbanization. Now, just at the right time, there are many scientists thinking about this problem in this future challenge, uh, current and future challenge. There are also answers in the background to how do we control mosquitoes. Some of them come from very standard techniques like the sterile insect technique. Some of them come from contemporary genetic editing techniques. Uh, but perhaps the one in the most vanguard of control techniques today has to do with a symbiotic bacteria called Wolbachia. And I'm going to tell you a lot about Wolbachia today, but I want to position you to think about Wolbachia as one of the great microbial therapy success stories of our time. When we think about fecal transplants or probiotics, these have specific effects on our species. Um, but the way mosquitoes are transmitting diseases, not only to humans, but to, to other animals such as livestock, there's a massive potential for saving more lives through Wolbachia bacteria uh, than fecal transplants or probiotic therapies right now. So um, the World Mosquito Program has leveraged and invented this technique essentially to be able to control the transmission of dengue virus which is an RNA virus pathogenic to humans across the world in something like 14 countries now. And you're looking at a summary of their data um, from place, cities and towns across the world. The percentages reflect the reductions in the local uh, case numbers of dengue virus after they've done releases of mosquitoes with Wolbachia. And this would be relative to before they released. These are the kinds of declines they're achieving. And as you can see, some of the numbers are as high as 98%. This is extraordinary success. And even when it's as low as 40%, um, that, that, that has a large impact on human health. Um, on the bottom there is the number of months that they had released those mosquitoes for to effectively move into the resident population and take over as the uh, pathogen blocking mosquitoes rather than the ones that transmit. Now, this is a method that really boils down to something as simple as Take a 80s Aegypti mosquito that transmits dengue or Zika virus. It normally doesn't have Wolbachia. Put a uh, Drosophila melanogaster Wolbachia, so WML Wolbachia, into it by microinjection. And then um, on, the out, on the outcome of that is somehow the mosquito is recalcitrant, is resistant. It prevents Zika and dengue from replicating inside the salivary glands of the mosquito, which is where the essential transmission site happens as mosquitoes bite us. The virus has to be in the salivary glands. Now, as a consequence of this microbial magic, if you will, um, the next step is then to release these green Melanogaster Wolbachia infected mosquitoes into a wild population in gray here that doesn't have Wolbachia. Um, so over time, the idea is that after generations, you can essentially replace a, tra a mosquito population that transmits these viruses with ones that can transmit those viruses. And then we march towards this goal of reducing um, the mosquitoes to maybe not first on the list to second, third, fourth, or fifth on the list as the most dangerous animals in the world. Um, and as you, as you just saw, this is not an imaginary uh, vision. This is one that's being implemented by the World Mosquito Program and a couple other entities uh, that are quite active in this area. I want to talk to you about the basic biology of Wolbachia today in large part, but we'll ultimately learn how a lot of the success of these programs is happening through that basic biology. And then maybe the ways we can translate basic understandings of Wolbachia to future enhancements of these control methods. So Wolbachia was discovered exactly 100 years ago. We are at the century mark by uh, Dr. Hertig and Wolbach. In fact, this was actually a graduate student and, and professor peer at Harvard University. And they were ripping open the abdomens of mosquitoes and a few other insect species and found these rod-shaped bacteria inside the ovaries. They looked like rickettsia bacteria to them, which were known. Um, and so they called them rickettsia-like, but in fact, later they were found to be distinct enough and were given the name Wolbachia because of the professor who discovered, uh, who helped discover the bacteria. 
They also made a uh, a prophecy, if you will. They only had their hands on a few insect species, but they kept finding this same rod-shaped bacteria and said, this should be pretty common in the whole group of arthropods. Of course, they didn't have PCR technology, um, high throughput uh, sampling methods. We do, as and, and in the 1990s, it was discovered that this was exactly the right prediction. So half of the world's arthropod biome has this Wolbachia symbiont in them, and there really is no limit to the taxa, the types of arthropods, or the places that Wolbachia can be found in. Um, and this maybe means that actually all arthropods at some point have come in contact with Wolbachia, and some species are losing it, and some species are gaining it on this perpetual cycle of Wolbachia floating around the arthropod world for estimated hundreds of millions of years. So this is a long, enduring arthropod bacterial symbiosis that we are now because of the science, are able to take advantage of this for human benefit. So in my lab, when we started working on this 25 years ago, we were working in a parasitoid wasp. You'll see some video of a male and a female doing courtship displays and mating. And I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, Wolbachia as, as you watch the video. Um, so here's a close up of Nisonia. And then if we were to rip open the abdomen of Nisonia, we would also see these bacteria. Sometimes they're circular, sometimes they're semi-rod shaped, and sometimes they're full-on rod shaped. They are pleomorphic, but one thing you'll notice is that there's multiple membranes around this bacteria, and those membranes in fact come from the host. They are Golgi-derived membranes that in effect cloak the symbiont inside the cells of the host cells that they reside in. So these are intracellular bacteria cloaked by a Golgi-derived arthropod membrane um, that helps sustain them. Now, if we were to fluorescently stain for the wasp DNA in blue on the top here, and then Wolbachia DNA in red, we would see Wolbachia is just jam-packed in the testes and re uh, reproductive tissues in general of these insects and many others. That's where Wolbachia specialize in. And this is the ovaries and Wolbachia are stained in orange and the host DNA is stained in green. So where the sperm and where the eggs are made, Wolbachia tend to concentrate, though they do occur throughout the body often at low densities in somatic tissues, but the germline is the place that these things have evolved, set up shop, and do most of their dramatic modifications on. Um, if we march forward to, let's say, the next step in reproduction, and we're looking now at the embryo that's been deposited by these, um, by these wasp females, you'll see that there's this cocktail of Wolbachia green bacteria here at this posterior end of the embryo, and the blue is the mitotically dividing DNA of the wasp embryo. So now we have co-development of the wasp genome and now the symbiont genomes as they replicate and distribute um, themselves as cells. This also means that Wolbachia are maternally transmitted from the ovaries and the developing eggs into the and now embryo. The fathers do not transmit the bacteria. So while they occur in the testes, only the mother's ovaries does the transmission to the next generation. So these are like mitochondria that are maternally transmitted. Um, the bacteria polarize towards this one end of the embryo because they are that ingenious, if you will. They, this is the part of the embryo in which the cells will become the reproductive tissue cells of the adult. And so they localize strongly before there's even a reproductive tissue to the region of the embryo that'll become that so that they become now inherited to the next generation by localizing in the mother's ovaries even before there's an ovary. Now, if you dig deeper into the symbiosis, you can keep scraping away the layers of this nested, uh, what is a tripartite symbiosis. So here, we're looking at a Wolbachia cell and these black arrows are pointing towards a bacteriophage inside the Wolbachia endosymbiont. So here's the Wolbachia cell outline, if you will. And then inside that is a massive cocktail of phages now that are bursting out of the, of the cell and almost in an act of lysis. And you can see that um, here as well. So this is a Wolbachia cell that looks very distorted. This is a highly degraded DNA patch that indicates cell death is happening. This is a inner membrane of the bacteria collapsing. It should be intact on the cell, on the outside of the cell, but it's collapsing inward as the phages make their way out of the cell. And then there are even observations of these phage particles floating around in the extracellular matrix of the wasp reproductive tissues. And this work was done by a, a lab tech, Michelle Marshall, a long time ago. But it really centered us on thinking about the phages as potentially 
uh, an important element of thinking about uh, what Wolbachia does to its host and how it's used for vector control. And I'll get into these connections a little deeper in a second. Um, across the Wolbachia phylogeny, so Wolbachia is an alpha proteobacteria um, and is related to many types of rickettsiales that are also intracellular bacteria and arthropods. Ehrlichia and a plasmon rickettsia are often pathogen transmitted. They're transmitted as pathogens from ticks or lice to humans. Wolbachia seems to have specialized in a different way. Uh, it is highly common and widespread in arthropods and doesn't often get transmitted, if at all, from arthropods to Wolbachia, to humans. Um, so Wolbachia has a different story within this clade of obligate intracellular bacteria. Uh, and Rim, who made this review back in 21, highlighted the phylogenetic clades of Wolbachia, which get these letter groups. Um, and within those clades, the orange color indicates whether the Wolbachia are parasitic versus the green mutualistic Wolbachia. And in some clades, they can be mixed up. The thing to note here is that uh, all of the orange clades uh, in arthropods have an association or have evidence of the bacteriophage being present. And so this is a connection, a, a curiosity, if you will, that perhaps something about reproductive parasitism, the way they modify insect testes and ovaries could be related to the phage's genome and information there. You'll see Wolbachia also occurs in nematodes and other uh, other diverse kinds of arthropods that we haven't talked about today. We're not going to get into that, but we could have a discussion at the end of the end of the talk. Okay, so I've been alluding to the success of the World Mosquito Program and these reproductive modifications, and this is where they all come together at a nexus point. Arguably, Wolbachia's greatest adaptation that's relevant to all of this is called cytoplasmic incompatibility, or CI for short, as we'll talk about it today. Now, in this Punnett square design, where we have crosses between infected and uninfected individuals, infected with Wolbachia, they're colored in, and uh, open circles are lacking Wolbachia. There's one cross in this particular Punnett square that generates the CI cross, in which the embryos die early during development. And this is called the CI cross between the infected male and the uninfected female. Now the rescue cross down here is when an infected male mates with an infected female and those offspring live. And this is an important part of the CI process that we have CI and then rescue of CI by the infected females and the embryos. This means that the propagation of the lineage that has Wolbachia, the embryos that have Wolbachia, gets a fitness advantage relative to the embryos that lack Wolbachia, because those embryos that don't have it die if they happen to be fertilized by sperm from an infected male. And this is the selfish adaptation then known as CI, because we're enhancing the fitness of the infection through this cytoplasmic incompatibility mechanism. And males are used as a pawn, um, essentially a, a, a sterile factor in order to spread the success of the Wolbachia infection. Now, the death of the embryo happens through uh, a post-fertilization set of errors in mitosis. So at the first mitosis, right after fertilization, a normal embryo has the paternal genome and a maternal genome that's dividing and making copies. But in a CI embryo, one of the earliest observations of something has gone wrong is this is the paternal genome in the middle, and it's not dividing properly into two separate units. In fact, it's being shredded in this, what we call this telomeric bridge that ends up in an aneuploidy state and the cell never, the embryo never recovers and that dies. Sometimes CI can pass through this valley. We're not quite sure how or why it does that. And we see embryos defective later in development. So now there've been a number of mitotic divisions, but also there's parts of the embryo that are just missing DNA as if mitosis never happened there. And this is going to be an embryo that dies as well, uh, just a little bit later than the first mitosis. So these are the ways that the infected male is delivering a cell biological error to the embryo that creates this CI cross. And somehow the females and the embryos with Wolbachia will rescue that uh, paternally delivered defect. Okay, so then the big question that connects all of this is what are the genes that essentially weaponize this adaptation that leads to Wolbachia being one of the greatest pandemics from the animal biodiversity world perspective, and that it occurs in half of the world's arthropod species, and arthropods represent 85% of all animal species. This is one of the most successful 
reproductive or parasites in the world as we know it from a biodiversity perspective. And then what is it that makes this vector control method work so well from the spreading perspective that these mosquitoes can, that block the viruses spread into populations with such efficacy? So we set out on a course in an unbiased way um, in the mid to like 2015, 2016 time period to find uh, what is the genetic basis of the cytoplasmic incompatibility trait. And Sarah and Jason in the lab at the time did comparative omics with genomes that cause CI or don't cause CI with transcriptomes and proteomes. And then they looked at the Venn diagram and essentially said, that's really curious. There's only two genes that strictly associate with the expression of cytoplasmic incompatibility. And those were labeled CI factors or CIF A and CIF B. Now, for anybody that does comparative genomics on this uh, seminar, you'll know that when you end up with two genes out of a comparative unbiased screen, you're either dead wrong because nobody gets two genes, there's normally hundreds, or somehow there's a stroke of luck and things might be on the right track. And so we went ahead and tested those, obviously, but I want to give you some context. These genes are indeed in the prophage region of the Wolbachia genome from Drosophila melanogaster, which is why we spent some time talking about the nested tripartite symbiosis. So in the middle of a viral genome that has normal structural genes, like making a base plate, making a head, making a tail, is a almost half the genome size module called the eukaryotic association module that Sarah discovered and labeled. And these are genes that are predicted to interact with animal arthropod hosts in ways that we just don't know much about at all. But the story today will be focused on the CIF-A and CIF-B genes that are located inside this module. Phylogenetically, CIF-A and CIF-B have co-phylogenetic patterns. They're essentially mirror images of, of each other. So um, they divide into multiple types of SIFs, but each SIF type is essentially uh, a mirror image of the other from the CIF-A and CIF-B perspective. And what that likely means is that these probably have some co-functioning um, uh, attributes in, in, the, in the Wolbachia or phage biology. And that was what we set out to determine. Now, there's no genetic editing tools in Wolbachia. So we can't knock out these genes and say, aha, we know their functions. We have to move the genes into Drosophila melanogaster by cloning them into the genome of the flies and then expressing them. So we're gonna take this cytoplasmic incompatibility Punnett square, and instead of looking at it from the Wolbachia perspective, look at it from the SIF perspective. We are now removing the Wolbachia and putting a SIF gene in the fly. And then we're gonna express those SIF genes with a promoter that specifically drives expression in the reproductive tissues, because that's where CI is, is expressed from. So this will be a testes or ovaries promoter. And that's gonna turn on GAL4. And GAL4 is a protein that binds to an upstream activating sequence, which then launches the expression of the CIF transgene protein. And so here we're gonna get CIF A and CIF B produced in a specific manner inside the testes or the ovaries. And that's what we're gonna set out to test. And we had a large groups of graduate students and um, undergrads helping us out in this project. So they're, they're shown above. Um, this is the Punnett square design. And in this work, ultimately we wanted to recapitulate the wild type cytoplasmic incompatibility. And that means we're measuring embryonic death. And so we translate that into the percentage of embryos that hatch into larvae. And you can see in a wild type Wolbachia normal CI cross, there's a bit of variation, but on average about 20% of the embryos hatch and the rest die. So that's an incompatible cross. We then set out to test if CIF A could recapitulate that and it couldn't. We see very normal uh, embryonic hatching rates for cultures of Drosophila melanogaster, about 95% embryonic hatching. CIF B alone does very much the same thing. And at this point, we were very skeptical that we had even found the right genes. We were left in that camp of, oh, we're off track. That was too good to be true. And at the last minute we said, why don't we just express them together? And we should have thought of that earlier but it was our last ditch. And indeed that recapitulated the embryonic lethality at even a stronger level than the wild type. And this is because transgenic expression can be 10 to a hundred times more powerful in making the protein more protein than in the wild type uh, situation. And the key of all of this work is that to ensure this wasn't an artifact of expressing phage genes inside an animal fly, we needed to ensure that that was a rescuable CI trait. So indeed, 
the Sif A, Sif B males cross to a Wolbachia containing female, she recognizes the sperm modification by these trans genes, and then that's a normal rescue cross as Wolbachia would do it otherwise. So this was validation that it was a bona fide CI trait, not, a, not an artifact. Um, we went a little bit further. We decided to keep pushing uh, the, the barometer here since this was all in a transgenic model. It wasn't knocking out genes just to make sure we're on the right track. And in this case, we decided to express CIF-A and CIF-B in an infected male with Wolbachia. Those males were aged, so they express weaker CI, which is common in Drosophila and Melanogaster. In fact, you can see the variation of the wild type CI is a lot bigger here. And now the average CI is about 40%, not 20%. When we express CIF-A in that same type of wild type aged male, we can push the CI level uh, to a stronger degree here. So there's less embryonic hatching. We can do the same thing with CIF-B. And then together with CIF-A and CIF-B, we can push it even further. So what this means is the transgenic product of the SIFs is working in conjunction with the wild type SIFs in order to titer in this protein and turn on more lethality. And that really led us to uh, being convinced that CIF-A and CIF-B were the cytoplasmic incompatibility genes. The, re the rescue gene remained an enigma. Um, I'm gonna kind of shorten the story on that and just say that Dylan Shropshire um, ultimately ended up testing um, the CIF genes for rescue capacity, because in the Venn diagram, only CIF A and CIF B came up as being associated with CI and rescue. So these sounded like good candidates that they might self-rescue themselves, in, if you will. And when CIF A is expressed in the female in the absence of Wolbachia, and that cross is shown here, this cross is normally producing lots of lethality, but with CIF A now expressed in the females, it rescues it and it's a compatible cross. So what we end up with is a two by one genetic model. This very simple phage toolkit is controlling a lot of the success of Wolbachia's spread in the arthropod world and the vector control methods that are used today with such great success all boils down to simply CIF A and CIF B. When we look at the evolution of these genes a little further, we're starting to annotate domains and essential regions that are relevant. In order to test what was important to the sites of these proteins, we looked at highly conserved sites across the proteins. And so Dylan, in an undergraduate MHIP, uh, did some amino acid substitutions to essentially see if we could ablate the function of the CIFA CI system by changing these two amino acids in region one, these two amino acids in region two, and so forth. And to make a long story short, what we found is that when we made all of these changes individually, this half of the gene is important for rescue in these sites in particular, whereas these sites aren't. And then for CI, there's an additional portion of the gene that's important for CI, and it also overlaps with the rescue portion as well. So it shows you kind of the way the protein might be both moonlighting as both a CI and rescue protein, but also adopts some specific, specific functions maybe for CI that aren't recapitulated in the rescue protein. So there's certainly some complex biology here going on with CIF-A, which reflects its dual role on the male and female side. Now, on the CIF-B side, um, we did the same experiment, and no matter what we changed and where we changed it, CI was ablated, which means these sites, the whole protein essentially was important for inducing CI. Um, so this gives us a sense of the essentiality of the full protein and uh, what is relevant to understanding from a molecular evolution perspective. I'll get into these domains in a little bit more in a second. In fact, that's where we're going next in our lab and have been publishing a little bit recently on, now that we've got the proteins and we know these genes, what is uh, the cell biological mechanism? What are the molecular crosstalk between these prophage proteins and the animal reproductive biology? What you're looking at here are the testes of the animal stained with yellow for DNA. How is it that these phage enzymes are manipulating sperm in order to cause cytoplasmic incompatibility? That's sort of a wild question because it's really unprecedented to think about a phage animal functional access. Um, so when you look at a Drosophila testes, there's this kind of circular nature to the testes and development begins uh, at the germline stem cells, which is over here. And then the sperm start to mature elongate and eventually become good old sperm. Now, if you were to essentially flatten out this testes and make it linear, 
these would be the stages of sperm development that you can see. Um, and some of these we'll get into in a very specific fashion today. But our big question is, having established these genes, now we want to know where are the proteins in spermatogenesis? So where do these CIF-A and CIF-B proteins locate? Are they cytoplasmic, nuclear? Are they particular to certain stages of spermatogenesis? And then what are they changing in the sperm genome? Okay, so remember that this is all a, a phage by symbiont by animal interaction. And so to look at these domains of the CIF-A and CIF-B gene, we actually need to look at them in the context of both putative interactions to the bacteria, as well as to the animal fly itself. One of the things that was discovered in the lab by Brittany was a former postdoc is that CIF-A seemed to have a nuclear localization signal. This is a, a eukaryotic nuclear localization signal inside a prophage gene. Uh, this was sort of an indication that maybe this gene somehow evolved to target eukaryotic nuclei. And the most important part of nuclear biology and spermatogenesis a battleground, if you will, for altering sperm is what's known as the histone to protamine transition. This is a insect to human conserved evolutionary developmental process. And what it does is sperm that are cells that are developing as round cells, uh, they have DNA that are bound by histones. They're large proteins, and that gives them the circular shape that we're accustomed to when we think about cells. The histones come off at this particular stage, uh, after the canoe spermata stage, and smaller proteins called protamines then come on the sperm. And those protamines, because they're smaller, allow the DNA to wind up even tighter. And that gives this needle shaped that we think about when we think about sperm. So you go from round to needle by removing histones and putting on protamines that wrap around the DNA. And then that leads to a normal functional sperm. So histones in pink are removed, and then uh, protamines in green come on. The protamines are shown as wheels here, but these are a conglomerate of small proteins that are much smaller than the um, than the histones themselves. So even in, in humans, infertility is often associated with an altered histone to protamine transition. When this goes wrong, sperm end up being infertile. So there's actually some good context to think that the nuclear part of this biology could be related to this particular process. Um, so Brittany and then RIM developed antibodies and RIM went to work on optimizing these to see where are these CIF proteins during spermatogenesis. So each of the stages of spermatogenesis are schematically shown above and then shown with fluorescent microscopy below. And then in green is CIF-A and in red is CIF-B. And what RIM found is that essentially CIF-A is always nuclear associated from beginning to um, almost the end of, of canoe stage spermatogenesis. In CIF-B, while it's difficult to see it at the apical tip, the beginning of spermatogenesis, we see CIF-B nuclear associated also through the same stage. So this provides then the, the validation that the CIFs are nuclear targeting and it's probably facilitated by that nuclear localization signal, a kind of crazy thing to think about. And we could validate this, RIM validated this not only in flies, but in mosquitoes as well. We see the same kind of phenomena that, that CIF-A associates with the sperm uh, and CIF-B associates with the sperm as well. So the nuclear localization signal, if it's essential to what we just observed with the cell biology, means that we could potentially show that by knocking it out. And therefore, we would lose the ability to cause cytoplasmic incompatibility. So we had a mutant that transgenically expressed a deleted nuclear localization sig signal. And now you can see the CIF-A protein is cytoplasmic during this round onion spermatid stage when it should be nuclear affiliated. And when we go ahead and test that functionally, in the wild type situation, of course, we get strong CI from the transgenic system. But when that nuclear localization signal is deleted, we now see almost no CI. So it's clear that this region of the protein and, and therefore the nuclear localization is essential for CI to occur. The CIF proteins have to make it in there early in spermatogenesis. Okay, so what about the histone and proteins? What's happening there? Well, what we're finding is that during this canoe stage, canoe spermatid stage, when they start to look like canoe shapes, that in a normal no CI male that doesn't cause any incompatibility, 
the histones are coming off. It's hard to see them here. There's a very fainter background signal on the sperm bundles. But in a wild type CI and in a transgenic CI system that ultimately caused the embryonic death, the sperm histones are retained for some amount of time at this particular spermatid stage. They eventually start to come off, but this elongated time period in which the histones are on creates the first artifact the, and problem. The second one is that uh, in conjunction with that, the protamines um, uh, end up being deficient. And what you're seeing here is a, is a fluorescent stain for DNA in which it binds to the sites that protamines normally bind to. So the lower the intensity of the stain, the more protamines are present. And you can see in a no CI situation, there's not a lot of protamine absence or deficiency here. But in the CI uh, treatment groups, there's a very bright stain indicating lots of protamine deficiency. This stain made it into the DNA where the protamine should be. Um, so we're able to confirm then that this is a lingering developmental problem for the CI sperm. And we can genetically show this is important for the function of CI because we can knock out protamines in Drosophila melanogaster and show that cytoplasmic incompatibility becomes stronger relative to a wild type CI cross where yes, there's still an incompatibility from CI, but when you enhance the protamine deficiency by knocking out some of the protamines, CI gets even stronger. So that suggests a definitive link between the histone and protamine transition problem and the cytoplasmic incompatibility trait. There it is. Okay, so we're gonna go even deeper here because it's still fascinating to think about how this phage enzymes have evolved to modify the reproductive biology of an evolutionary conserved process. Um, and we're going to move from the nuclear localization signal to a couple other domains. And the other domain in CIF-A, uh, putative domain, is called the PUF RNA binding domain, which suggests that there could be some amount of interaction with RNA molecules. And then there's a transcription factor domain as well. Once again, could be RNA-related biology. So we move then from thinking about the CIFs going into the nucleus to what are they doing to the nucleus? Well, maybe they're altering transcription in some way or gene expression in some way. Now the CIF loci, um, the CIF B loci have two nuclease domains that are predicted to be DNAases. And those would then be nicking DNA perhaps at hyper levels that are erroneous to sperm development. So now we've got thoughts about what could be happening inside the nucleus of these um, CI uh, related uh, males. Okay, so let's go ahead and design some assays to test that. There's two assays we use. One is in vitro assays and the other is in vivo. Uh, for the in vitro assays, what we did is we cloned the CIF-A and CIF-B enzymes into E. coli. And then E. coli makes a ton of these CIF-A and CIF-B enzymes separately. We purify them out and then test them against substrates of RNA and DNA to see if they are indeed interacting with cleaving RNA or DNA. And then in the fly itself, we can use the transgenic system that we already talked about and ask, well, does what we see in vitro also happen in vivo or in situ, which would be inside the tissues of the testes in this case? And we're looking for, are the RNA and DNA modified, depleted um, in a transgenic uh, male expressing these, these enzymes? Okay, so on the left here is the enzymatic assays, and we're looking at substrates of single-stranded DNA and double-stranded DNA exposed to the CIF-A and CIF-B enzymes, and then there's the DNA-only control. And EDTA minus is a condition in which the enzyme will be active. If you add EDTA in, it's a condition in which it'll inhibit the enzyme, and we should not expect any cutting of the DNA. And what I can draw your attention to in that framework is that whether it's single-stranded or double-stranded DNA, in the treatment groups that are expected to be enzyme active, we see that these enzymes chew up the DNA. Um, and then that in, is a, a reaction that's inhibited when we add in the EDTA. So that indicates both CIF-A and CIF-B are at least in vitro DNA aces. We then moved into the in situ side of this, looked at the testes with a DAPI stain for DNA, and a tunnel green stain for DNA damage, indicating nicking that directly relates to the DNA activity. And what we can see in a wild type and transgenic CI system is that there's lots of overlap between the DNA damage green stain and the blue uh, sperm developing DNA. 
And in the NOCI control, there's very low levels of tunnel activity. So this confirms that the DNA activity in vitro is also occurring at the essential stage of the histone to protamine transition for CI. Okay, so um, this is a DNA damage trait that lingers in some way. We're not quite sure how, but when these CI sperm fertilize the embryo, and we look at embryonic development a couple hours in, and we stain with a histone marker for DNA damage, the CI embryos have a lot of DNA damage going on in the red there, quantitated to your right, whereas in the no CI control, there's no evidence of DNA damage. Um, it's not clear that the sperm DNA damage in spermatogenesis is acutely related to the embryonic DNA damage we're seeing in the CI embryos. These could be sort of, you know, miles apart in terms of the pathways generating them. But there is this connection of something of an error we see in sperm is leading to a similar error in the development of the embryo. Okay, on the RNA side now, what we find is uh, that CIF-A in particular is an in vitro RNase. So the CIF-B doesn't cleave, but the CIF-A does cleave a synthetically made single-stranded RNA. And those reactions are um, uh, were actually quite a surprise to us in some degree because the field hadn't identified a function for CIF-A yet. And the RNase activity was uh, just something that really came at us because of some of the annotations and thinking we had on it, but there was no precedent for, for CIF-A being an RNase. And what we found uh, ultimately is that inside the uh, sperm development, now we're in the spermatocyte, so very er early sperm developmental cells, that there is a long non-coding RNA that is depleted in the CI situation, and that long non-coding RNA is stained in red but it's more abundant in the no CI compatible control spermatocytes. And the key here is that um, this long non-coding RNA is already known to be a regulator of the histone to protamine transition. And so RIM really cued in on this as a candidate for what type of RNA may be modified because it had already been established in the fly literature as a histone to protamine regulator that happens early in development. And now we can see the CIF-A enzyme is tinkering with this particular regulatory long non-coding RNA. Okay, that's an association, right? We can see enzymatic activity. We can see staining inside the testes that is consistent with our trait. But then we connected uh, mutant ablation with the long non-coding RNA depletion in CI. And to elaborate on that just briefly, um, this particular mutant in that puff RNA binding domain uh, we used it to show that when it's expressed, the long non-coding RNA is present and normal, right? So we shouldn't see any CI there. Um, this is, in contrast, a different CIF-A mutant that actually causes CI. We didn't we didn't change anything about CI here. And in that normal CI case, the long non-coding RNA is depleted, as we would expect for the CI and long non-coding RNA linkage. Um, this then translates later in development to histone retention with the mutant, uh, sorry, with the CI control. But in the mutant one that ablates CI, there isn't a lot of histone retention. This is a normal essential profile. And the same goes for protamine deficiencies. That you can see a lower protamine deficiency in the ablated CI versus the CI. So all the things that are triggered from these alterations in the long non-coding RNA um, are consistent with what we were finding at the, the broader scope level of the histone to protamine transition. It appears then that indeed, the ability to turn on or off is the rest of sperm development. Okay, let's bring it all home then. So we have a fly with Wolbachia. That Wolbachia has a small genome, about 1.2 megabases. Inside that genome is a prophage region called WO that has a eukaryotic association module in it, and that's where the CIF genes are. So we have CIF-A and CIF-B, and these have annotated domains that relate to the biology of what we just observed from gene to essentially symbiotic interactions here. And thinking about the cell biology mechanism, um, we're trying to move our way in deeply into the process of spermatogenesis. And so far, the first thing that we can see as an error is the long non-coding RNA depletion at the spermatocyte stage. That then triggers histone retention, um, which is coupled with extended DNA damage um, assisted by CIF-A and CIF-B. And then protamine deficiency is the last signal we see of these CI sperm before they leave and deliver their paternal effect lethality to the embryo. So prophage-encoded CIFs 
invade the nuclei of animal sperm, uh, altered regulation of this long non-coding RNA, and altered chromatin integrity establishes the CI in spermatogenesis as part of a host modification model. And this is the first example of nuclear targeting uh, prophage proteins impacting eukaryotic gametogenesis um, in ways that really open our eyes to what prophages can do to eukaryotic biology. The big picture is, you know, there is a global pandemic from the arthropod perspective. Wolbachia occurs in half of those arthropods. Um, one of the main phenotypes that Wolbachia causes is CI. And it's just these simple genes that have targeted a conserved evolutionary developmental process that happened to come from a phage that have led to this great success story. And that success story is also built as leading to these programs that are making a better future. So I mentioned the World Mosquito Program. There is a company in the United States called Mosquito Mate, and there's a Google spin-off company called Verily that are all in this space using cytoplasmic incompatibility to control vector-borne diseases. Um, the, the, the Verily case is kind of fun because they like to use robots since they were Google affiliated. So they have uh, robots breeding factories of mosquitoes, and then they have automated vans that roll down windows and release mosquitoes into towns that they're controlling uh, in that very Google-esque way. So the robots are essentially already taking over for this. Um, I didn't talk about the ramifications of what CI does to arthropods and beyond vector control, but because they cause this reproductive problem, it can also be implicated in the speciation process. Um, we could talk more about that uh, at the at the question session. So having established then this bigger picture of that phages really can matter to endosymbionts, um, and typically endosymbionts are thought to be streamlined and really tiny and perfect genomes, but that's not the case in many uh, arthropod uh, symbionts that transmit horizontally like Wolbachia. They do pick up lots of elements like phages and transposons, and that's because they are so common, right? Wolbachia live in half of the world's arthropod species. They're going to contact novel gene pools and pick up elements that are selfish that in turn attack the Wolbachia. So this is a bit of uh, killing the spreader. The phages are just taking advantage of how, how common Wolbachia are. Um, the phages can also, by, by lysing Wolbachia, they can reduce endosymbiont density. So when we think about the what controls densities, we should be thinking about phage lysis in the symbiosis. The phages, I didn't talk about this, but they are rapid evolving hotspots of evolutionary change for the bacteria. The prophage hotspots are the fastest evolving portions of the genome with insertions, deletions, and SNP changes. And as we established, the phages bring in the secret adaptation genes that make Wolbachia one of these successful symbionts. And also these phages move laterally between co-infecting symbionts. In fact, up to 50 KB of DNA can be exchanged between co-infecting Wolbachia. So we tend to think about Wolbachia more like E. coli now than we do a standard nutritional endosymbiont that doesn't have all of these flux and flux systems and attributes. In other words, take an insect that has an endosymbiont and if it happens to be Wolbachia, it has this whole ecology going inside the, their cells, multiple Wolbachia symbionts, exchanging phages between them to now move these SIF genes and other genes around the genomes. It's also true that facultative intracellular bacteria that come in from outside the insect and spend a little bit of time inside the insect could be a source of phage and other genetic information. And then it's very common and known for a couple of decades now that Wolbachia and their prophage genes can move to the insect or arthropod nuclei themselves and take up shop as a horizontal gene transfer event between bacteria and phage and the animal host. Okay, so I'll just wrap up with a little bit of talk on our science education. Um, if this symbiosis is as common as it is and is of interest, um, we've developed a program called the Wolbachia Project out of the Discover the Microbes Within theme. And uh, Sarah is leading this five-part lab series that's open and access and freely available online if you just search for it, where we enable high schools and intro to college level uh, students do biodiversity, so they collect their own arthropods, biotechnology, because they get chitin reagents and do DNA extractions and PCR and gels, and then bioinformatics in which they'll get a sequence product from Wolbachia, usually the 16S gene, and then they're enabled to do a bioinformatics and phylogenetic lab. 
Um, these are just some students who a uh, long time ago when we were first running this uh, were involved in uh, some of the early labs, but we now have um, 19 countries across the world running this, 44 states in the United States, and sometimes international collaborations where our schools get together, they target a certain species in common and then share their uh, Wolbachia story uh, on online conferences. There's a affiliated Wolbachia project database where students get to publish their work and put that on their resumes with a DOI link that this is their insect, this is what they discovered, and this is their, their, their evidence that they accumulated in the five-part lab series. Okay, with that, I will just end that I'm speaking to you from this building at Penn State. It's called the Millennium Science Complex. Um, uh, we are uh, housing and direct the One Health Microbiome Center here. Uh, for anybody interested in the microbiome sciences, whether you want to be a graduate student or a postdoc, um, we have a really vibrant community here. Uh, we have the first PhD degree in the microbiome sciences in the world. Uh, we have membership from 42 departments, and our socials are shown here. I'll just stop now, uh, let people take a couple notes if they want, and then I'm happy uh, for the questions to come in and see what you have to think about all this. Thank you for listening. That, that, that was amazing. You promised me a, a talk, but it was a, a thriller. Really, <laughs> no, I, I love it. What an Thank amazing you, story. I appreciate that. Yeah, we should make a Wolbachia movie someday. Yes, yes. we should. Yes. So, yeah, I'm sure there are questions. So just uh, raise your hand. Uh, feel free. Yes, uh, Yuval Gottlieb. Hi, Seth. Yeah. How are you doing? Hey, Yuval. Great. Good to see you. How are Good you? Good to see you, too. Yes. I'm fun, okay. Yes. Always fun listening to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this talk. Uh, all my students are around. Um, yeah, I've read your paper, and I just wonder what your thought about the um, rescue function. Yeah. Of the CIF A in yeah. an RNAs. What's going so we, on there? We we indeed, right? So and and we, we've tried to allocate our resources to understanding one side and we're getting ready to understand the other side. And that's what uh we just got a grant to 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 pursue that a little bit further. So here's how we think this works. Um the histone and protamine transition is going to slow down the entry of the paternal genome into mitosis. It's coming in altered in some way, right? It's chromatin integrity is not the normal paternal genome. And so in order for rescue to occur, rescue has to be aligned in timing to that slowed down entry point into the first mitosis. So our hypothesis is CIF a has similarly modified the maternal chromatin to slow it down enough that it then sinks in timing to a delayed mitotic entry and now the embryo develops quite fine. And this would align with some of the work by the Sullivan lab and some of the modeling by uh, Peter Hammerstein with the mistiming model on how the SIF genes could be controlling essentially the timing of mitosis. And the effect on the paternal maternal chromatin, maybe by similar or different pathways, ultimately leads to an alignment of mitotic timing. So when there's... Uh non-infected sperm, non-modified sperm. Right. So what how happens that, there? Yeah. yeah. So that lines in, that was our question too, was like, how do we get, how do we explain this if that's our model? It turns out the maternal chromatin sets the entry point into mitosis. It gets to decide when it enters into mitosis. So it has more control over that entry point than the father's side does. So if CIF A is delaying the maternal chromatin and the father's chromatin comes in normal, that's okay. In Drosophila biology, maternal chromatin, whether fast or slow, gets to determine when mitosis alignment begins. And so this would provide then a perfect mechanism to explain why the males could come in unmodified, the females could be slowed down, but eventually the females essentially catch up and then initiate mitosis. To be determined, that's a model that seems to be consistent with the data right now. We'll be looking for um, chromatin integrity changes on the maternal side to see if we can back up that model. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yes, Ilan Ozenchang, you're muted. A beautiful work. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first one is um, related to whether this bacteria can spread horizontally. Mm -hmm. It's strange because it must, based on the phylogenetics, it must jump between arthropods 
on an evolutionary time scale because there's very little alignment between the Wolbachia phylogeny and the host phylogeny. But yet, as you learn today, Wolbachia is really dominantly vertically transmitted. So we study it in that light, but yet on a broader scale, it clearly transfers around. So then the question is, is how does it transfer? Uh -huh. um, and there's some hypotheses that predator-prey interactions may mediate transfer. So for example, an uninfected predator eats an infected prey, digests that Wolbachia and, and arthropod, and some Wolbachia spill out and enter into the hemolymph, get into the reproductive tissues and colonize it. There's a little bit of evidence in Drosophila where somebody injected um, a slurry of Wolbachia into the abdomen of a fly. And after three weeks later, it migrated in the hemolymph to the female's ovaries and colonized and became vertically transmitted. These are not very active areas of investigation, but some of the current uh, efforts in this area seem to suggest these are routes of possibility, um, whether it's a parasitoid host relationship or siblicides killing each other, the predator prey model seems to have some amount of legs. So there aren't any evidence for chlamydia like um, uh, development? Uh, like extracellular forms, uh, mm -hmm. right. Uh, spore bodies. I think that remains a large hypothesis, a curiosity, but nobody's ever presented, uh, let's say, microscopy evidence of a different form that might allow it to be a extracellular state. It should be on the list, though, of possibilities given the frequency of Wolbachia transfer in arthropods. And the other question, zooming in into your work, um, obviously, you, when you express this uh, protein, both of them in E. coli, uh, toxicity was none or minor because you could purify the protein, right. indicating that they have some self-limiting or some specificity. Uh, otherwise, what's going on? Right, right. I think that's a great question. How, how much, what's the range of DNA and RNA that these enzymes can modify? And of course, if they were so toxic to the E. coli system, when we wouldn't have gotten protein to purify, clearly that wasn't the case. Um, so yeah, I agree with your interpretation there. There's, there's a big range between zero and 100 here. And we know it can target eukaryotic stuff in some synthetic oligonucleotides, but we don't know what's in the middle and the beginning. And, uh, that, you know, that sort of lends itself to lots of in vitro assays uh, of maybe testing different species molecules and seeing what they can and cannot cut. It might also lend itself to some modeling about what, you know, what are the molecular interactions between the protein and the nucleotide molecules that might give it some specificity there. Um, definitely, a, 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 it might help us resolve about how C, how general can CI be, because CI is in most of the major orders of arthropods, so it must have a general capacity at some level, but it also may be um, restricted to not be too toxic to other domains of life. But, the, you know, in many, many cases, the host, I mean, the eukaryotic host is activating the toxin. Mm, yeah. So. Yeah, that's right. Processing, modification, continuation. Good so, point. There may be some post-translational modifications, even in the fly, that is allowing them to be active as DNA. Then you see activity even in the E. coli purified. Unless the post, unless the post-translational modifications are different in the yeah, E. coli right. versus the flies, that seems likely actually. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good thought. Uh, there's a question in the chat. If you, if you can open. Okay. Sure. That's it. Yeah. Uh, two questions: the in vitro assays show the proteins can act independently. Why do you think you need both CIF A and CIF B for CI? Yeah. So, um, good question. So. What I think is happening is there's a cascade of errors and spermatogenesis, and I think the evidence bears that out. That first is long non-coding RNA has to be hit in order to establish the first step of CI. But if you do that only on its own, it won't carry through unless you have the DNA's uh, activity at the later spermatogenesis step. And that's why CIF A alone doesn't cause CI. It only causes CI with CIF B. So in some sense, the enzymatic activity findings really line up nicely with our system on getting these two proteins to have important and different functions to some degree. 
Given the clear advantage of CI for Wolbachia, why do the genes stay on the prophage and don't move to the chromosome? Do you have freeloader Wolbachia in the population? Love it. Great question. So in fact, there are prophage wo uh, that are contracting by as much as 75%. They've lost most of their genes. And the ones they retain tend to be the CI genes and some other uh, genes that we've also worked on that are known as ma male-killing Canada genes. And so there is this uh, model that seems to be playing out in real time in front of us that you don't need the full phage. You just need these genes for the Wolbachia to be a CI strain. And uh, the prophage deterioration reflects that. Thank you for those questions. Great thoughts. Uh, there's a question by uh, Boaz Yuval. Boaz, hey, hi, Seth. Uh, thank Hello. you for, uh, for a great talk. Really, really nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, how... Do the 50% of arthropods that don't have Wolbachia resist the infection? Yes. So um, I wish I knew that answer, right? That would, that's a big question. Uh, I, there are a couple of thoughts on that. One is, is actually they aren't resistant. They, um, they just haven't been exposed to Wolbachia yet. And their, their time will come, right, in the next 100,000 generations, if you think about Wolbachia moving around enough. But it also means that some of those should have lost Wolbachia as well, that some of those were once exposed and then lost. So how do you lose a Wolbachia? Well, it could be that uh, the host evolved a counter adaptation, uh, some kind of immune suppression of the Wolbachia, um, or it could be that the Wolbachia degraded itself, that somehow, let's say, the CI genes that have spread Wolbachia around got hit by stop codon mutations, and now that Wolbachia is very ineffective. And if that Wolbachia happens to cause a, even a slight fitness cost in fecundity or other survival aspects, then the uninfected host would outcompete the infected host. Um, we do see degradation of these genes um, across Wolbachia diversity that associate with the loss of CI. And so it does look like, you know, at the snapshots of evidence, that would be a very viable model. Um, in the, in the long-term continuum of thinking about how will Bakia come and go? We have to project out from that evidence to those kinds of scenarios. I hope that's somewhat satisfactory. I think that's the best we can do right now. Unless we, you know, maybe we could experimentally test in the lab if you take a defective Wolbachia that doesn't cause CI and compete it against an uninfected insect, put them in the same population cage. Probably the case, unless Wolbachia evolves some beneficial interaction that'll be lost in the cage. That would be a fun experiment to do. Thank you. Seth, do, do you find a CIFA and CSV conserved beyond Wolbachia in other uh, organisms? So the, the homolog of where this thing came from is completely enigmatic. Um, they are so rapidly evolving, and Wolbachia are also so divergent from its closest ancestors that it's very difficult to find a smoking gun signal. People are looking, have looked. And they, they claim to have found very divergent CIF homologs, ranging from some of the Rickettsiales to um, the Cardinium symbiont of arthropods that causes cytoplasmic incompatibility. But the evidence is, you know, blurry. It's not like a, an exquisite, closely related match that we would know the exact transfer event that might have led to this. Um, so I think we've got a few missing links there to figure out where not only the SIFs came from, but where the phages came from. That's still a mystery as well. Yeah. Thank uh, you. One last question. Uh, so how did you find this specific link RNA from all the possible genes in the in the sperm? Yeah, I give complete credit to uh, Rupinder Kaur, who's a research professor in the lab. And uh, Rim, she goes by short, is was basically brought this to the tables where he's thinking about RNA-ace activity. And she said, I want to test this because it's involved in the um, histone and protamine transition that we've already shown evidence for. And I said, that seems like a long shot, Rim. It's like a needle on the haystack. Go for it, but I don't think it's going to work. Um, my approach was going to be, we'll just test all the RNA. Like, uh, let's see if RNA is generally depleted first and think about it in an unbiased way. Well, she proved me wrong. I'm glad that she did. Um, and ultimately, that paper you know, was born out of her persistence to stick with that molecule and um, really opened our eyes to a lot of new biology as well. Amazing. Yeah. Do we have any final question to set? Yes, uh, Kirtana. Hi, thanks for, first, thanks for the opportunity to attend um, and really interesting hypotheses and ideas. 
um just curious if uh, i'm not sure if i remember right but um i remember you showing that tree with the mutualist and the parasitic wolbachia right. so i'm wondering if the mutualist wolbachia in female flies um can also rescue cytoplasmic in incompatibility Ooh. um yeah Good question. There's no evidence uh, that those mutualistic ones have the SIF gene. So we would uh, very confidently say they, they aren't rescuing. The mutualistic ones tend to do things like enhance oogenesis, enhance development of uh, metamorphosis. Um, and when you remove them by antibiotics, then the hosts will suffer and they become, uh, you know, they die during development without Wolbachia or they lose their fecundity because they're no longer making eggs, for example. Um, it doesn't preclude that we might find that someday, though, that there could be uh, a rescue only strain that's a highly mutualistic strain. So it appears to be maintaining balance in the Wolbachia force, if you will. So I like your question and thought there. It could lead to something that we're not, uh, the community is not actively looking for right now. Thank you. Thanks. Awesome. Yes, uh, Victor Wilder, Tel Aviv University. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Given that these proteins are interacting with the, the host, is there any evidence for uh, horizontal transfer from the host of some domains in these proteins or other proteins that interact with the host? Right. Um, and, you know, the transgenic system allows us to see that future, right? Because it's these SIF genes can be active from that location. We've codon optimized these proteins. So in, in part, codon optimization might be important to how they're working in the in the flies. Um, the genes may have moved in horizontal genome transfer events from Wolbachia to the host uh, fly. There are whole genomes that live in chromosomes of arthropods. And so I think there could be something to look at there that I haven't done myself or seen anything on. But what, you know, what's happening to the SIF genes when they're evolving in that context? I actually meant the other way around. The evolution of the SIF genes ar arose by or is that a transfer of some domains from the host to the bacterium? Okay, uh, that would put us in the possibility land because the divergence levels to the ancestors of these SIF genes are make it really hard to find a good homolog. So we could say yes, right? That maybe there's a domain that's really important that came from the host. Like that nuclear localization signal, where did that come from? So I like your thinking there that maybe some of these are bits of information coming from the eukaryote. For other genes in the phage, we definitely have evidence of that, that the animal pieces of DNA can be stuck into various portions of the phage DNA, but not the whole gene, just kind of snippets of it. So yeah, I like the thought that arthropod to phage transfers set up the phage to be able to do what it does now. That would be actually a pretty parsimonious route for all this. Thank you. Do we have any last question to set? Okay. So thanks, thanks again for a really Thank fascinating you. story. Uh, it was quite popular. We had more than uh, 40 listeners at some point. Great. Uh, and hope to see you sometime in person. Thank you for all the excellent questions, everybody. And uh, let's hang out more. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a great day.